So, it's a pleasure to introduce Peter McCulloch from the um, University of Chicago, a, a real statistician, and um, or at least from a department of statistics. Um, and uh, Peter, before you start, would you like to take questions during the talk, or would you like to leave them all until the end? Well, I'm happy to take uh, questions during the talk. Okay, so if you want to ask questions, either ask over the chat, or uh, it seemed to work perfectly well with people just interrupting yeah, last time. They, uh, yeah, the as, long as, it get out, as long as it doesn't get out of hand. So um, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm sorry about the, the time my, issue. Uh, entirely my fault. But it's very good to, uh, to, to have you speaking. So, um, okay, well, um, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to speak and my apologies once again for getting the time wrong. Um, this talk is going to be a very uh, concrete. It's going to be entirely from the point of view uh, of, of a statistician who coming at this uh, not knowing uh, anything about categories at all. And, uh, but uh, very much from the point of view of, uh, well, the statistician's point of view is uh, that uh, there's a crucial difference between uh, the process that we're studying which is typically in some sense infinite dimensional and what we can observe, which is always finite in some sense, finite or finite dimensional. And, and when that issue comes up, there's always the, issue, the, the matter of uh, uh, what you do or what you say or what operations you do have to be consistent for either for different uh, samples of different sizes or for designs of different structure. Uh, all relating to the uh, same system. So uh, that's uh, my background. I'm, I'm interested in stochastic processes in general, but from a statistician's point of view, how samples relate to, to all of this and in particular, and, and the, the three topics that I'm going to talk about today are all uh, in that sense uh, um, uh, related to the consistency for samples or subsets of different sizes. Um, and the first one is uh, basically to do with the simple random sampling. It's a very elementary example. And the second one is what, we, what I call spectral sampling. Uh, and the third one has to do with uh, uh, factorial design. So that's a different topic, but uh, the similar sort of uh, issues for consistency for different uh, uh, samples of different sizes. Now I should say I'm a I'm a, an applied statistician, always have been, uh, but I've, I've uh, known Saunders McLean for a lo long number of years, and he was a regular, I thought I'd say a few words of, uh, about my interactions with him, that he was a regular at the Quad Club uh, lunch table and frequently uh, joined our statistics group. We had a regular table and the math department uh, did, did not, so he frequently joined our table and he was always uh, had free with his opinions and occasionally he talked about category theory although I never knew anything what it was what it was about he never had any uh, never seemed to have any connection with probability or statistics and um, well to say that Saunders was a curmudgeon uh, is, is certainly at least in my experience true and he's usually friendly but certainly not always uh, he was a, 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 an extrovert and he loved debate and argument and controversy, but I, I never learned any category theory from him. Um, when I got into this sort of thing about 20 odd years ago, I talked to Bert Tataro, who was a young assistant professor in the Department of, Statistics, uh, Department of Mathematics at Chicago, and he, he sort of uh, introduced me give me a gentle introduction to uh, most of this material, none of which I'd ever heard of before. But Bert, in terms of personality, is exactly the opposite. Uh, Saunders, he's, he's, he's very quiet and very reserved. And okay, so that's just for uh, historical background. Okay, so let me just say a little bit about samples and subsamples. Now I should say there's going to be very few commutative diagrams. Uh, in this, uh, it's going to be very concrete. So, from uh, a statistician's point of view, uh, in, in the 
in this particular, uh, for this particular sort of setup, that we're interested in, I suppose you would call it a, an exchangeable process in some sense. Um, the, the universe, what we'll call the universe or the population, is a set of things that we might, or in principle, could observe. Um, the items, whatever it is that are being studied, and the sample is always finite. Um, and so the, notionally there's a process. So to every uh, unit in the population there corresponds a value. And it's not always a real number, of course, but uh, just for the definiteness and notation and what uh, goes follows, I will presume that the, the value for each uh, unit in the population is, is a real number or complex number or or even a vector, but just keep it real for simplicity. And so the process is, uh, is in some sense usually infinite. You, I will not be very, it doesn't really matter a great deal whether script you uh, is, uh, is finite or, or infinite or countably infinite or non-countably infinite, um, but usually it'll be at least uh, infinite. And the observation is just the restriction of the process to the, the sample. Um, so the, the goal is statistics in some sense is to, is given the um, observations on the sample, what can we say about the values of the process on extra sample units? And that does, I suppose, automatically leads you to the notion of a stochastic process. So, implicitly is going to be some sort of process and I will uh, at least for the first example take it to be an exchangeable process. That means in practice that means that there are no covariates uh, that are available to distinguish the distribution uh, of uh, the response from one individual to another. So there are no, there are no males and females for example uh, in the population. They're all uh, considered to be uh, of the same distribution. Okay, so um, if you've got your sample, it's natural to summarize it in one way or another, and that uh, leads to the notion of symmetric functions. If you, if these, uh, if if there's no distinction among the uh, units, and you want to summarize it, you certainly you usually would do it in, uh, in terms of a symmetric function of one type or another and at least for the first part of this talk today I will consider polynomial symmetric functions for the most part. So uh, h here is a function on the observed values and it's a symmetric function sigma is a permutation and there are various sorts of polynomial symmetric functions that might uh, be considered for various purposes. Um, but the, the problem with um, symmetric functions is that uh, the symmetric group just acts on sets of a given size and there's no connection between the group acting on n on samples of size n and the group acting on samples of size n plus one and so on. So these uh, equivalence classes are just the the sizes of the, um, the sample sizes are, are, are isolated and so there's nothing to connect samples of size 5 with samples of size 6 with samples of size 60. So we want to look at these um, various candidate symmetric functions and ask what it is that ties them together for samples of different sizes in one way or another. And that um, there seems to me something of the flavor of categories in that, in just phrasing the question that way, although I don't exactly know what the best way of phrasing it, uh, of, of, of expressing it in category terms is. Um, so a sample of size n taken from a population. So I will typically use capital N and little n with brackets around them to mean sets uh, of the integers, just as labels for the individuals in the, either the population or the sample. And when I talk about uh, the category of samples, I will typically mean the set of injective maps. 
from a smaller set into a larger set. And, uh, and the, the number of these uh, maps is just the descending factorial uh, function. Right, now, but a simple, a simple random sample uh, of size little n taken from a uh, population of size capital N is just uh, one of these maps chosen uniformly at random. And uh, then the observer, so the, the process is this function here from the population into the real numbers. And the simple random sample is just the simple random sample is this function, and then the simple random sample values are the composition. Right, so just as an example here, here taking capital N equal to four and little n equal to three. Um, so uh, there are four, uh, well, there are four, four factorial uh, maps, and the composition function, the composition of Y with this uh, with the uh, simple random sample will be uh, some permutation of this with probability one over 24, some permutation. Now this is the one that has a 3.2 missing. And uh, then the, some permutation of this uh, with 5.1 missing and some permutation of this vector with 4.8 missing and some permutation of the remaining three with the first one missing. So they, this uh, expression as a random variable is equal in distribution to this, this uh, probability distribution. Okay. So the, the average of the, the average on the population. Peter, there's a question from Arthur. Yes, Arthur. Um, yes, I just wanted to know if that morphism var phi, the map from bracket n lowercase to bracket n capital um, can be viewed as a stochastic matrix that associates to each element the uniform probability? Yeah, on... so uh, uh, that's, that's a good question. And I'm going to oscillate from one interpretation to the other. So when I talk about the category of injective maps, I will mean that there are this many maps from n to n. They're not non, and they're non-random. When I talk about the category of simple random samples, those will be sort of aggregated into a fuzzy map, if you like. So there's only one map. One simple random sample is a stochastic. Uh, now, it, it's not the, yeah. Does that answer your question? Arthur? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so the goal here is to try to associate uh, the symmetric functions on, on smaller samples with symmetric functions on larger samples. And here I've written down uh, three different symmetric functions just for illustration. And uh, there's the average, and this is the average in the, in the population. And it happens to be 4.825 for the numbers that I've shown you here for n equal to capital N equal to four. Here's a second one, which is the usual sample variance or population variance in this case, the, but it's divided by N minus one and that's quite important. And that number comes out to be so. And there's a third one just for illustration here and it's the, what's usually called the third case statistic. And its value is as shown. This is computed now for N equal to four. So these three particular statistics are, are, are what are called Fisher's K statistics, the first three of them. Um, now, if you calculate on the smaller sample for n equal to three, what are the possible averages? You find that the possible averages are these four with a probability of quarter each. And the average of those averages is 4.825 which is exactly the same as the average in the population. It's also true if you take this function, this uh, second case statistic, and you ask what is the average value of it averaged uniformly over 
samples of size three taken from this set of size four, it will, it, it will be 4.6075, exactly the same as the numerical value in the, in the population. And, and it's critical for this to be, for this uh, identity to hold exactly, it's critical that they have the divisor n minus one here because the divisor for, for population of size four will be three, but the divisor for the sample of size three will only be two. And likewise for this third one, the average value of the case three on all of the, on all of the uh, simple random samples is uh, exactly the same as this number computed in the population. So the, this, uh, so the total, for example, does not have these properties and most uh, sort of functions that you'd write down will, will not have this property that the average value uh, of the function, well, first of all, you have to define the function for all sample sizes bigger than a certain number. And, and then they have to have this uh, inherit, what I will call inheritance on the average. So this concept here of inheritance in the average, on the average is what's going to tie together functions on uh, symmetric functions on one space with symmetric functions on a lower dimensional space. Okay, so I'm going to use the word natural for this. I know, understand it's a category term, but I'm sure this is a category, a natural functional, uh, on uh, a natural function on, on, on functors. Um, so a natural statistic of degree D, uh, it's important that you specify the degree. First of all, it's a sequence of functions, um, real valued for definiteness here and it's defined for every n greater than or equal to the degree. And the, the defining property is that for every point in the big space, and for every, and uh, for simple random samples, the average over all of these functions uniformly distributed on this set of the, the descending factorial number, uh, the average value of the sample values is exactly equal to the population value. And that's true, going to be true for every capital N and little n. So that's the uh, definition. Uh, and in general, these things don't have to be polynomials. And there's a way of constructing them explicitly. But for polynomial functions, they have a very nice uh, structure. And, and that's what I will be, uh, uh, that's what I'm the first, the three that I showed you in the previous transparency uh, are polynomial functions. And they're not the only ones. They're, uh, they're also uh, ones that are called polyk's, uh, which were introduced by uh, Chuki in the 50s. The k statistics were introduced by Fisher in 1929, although Fisher did not give this, uh, this uh, rationale for them. It was a different rationale. Th this rationale was due to Chuki in the 50s. Now I want to take that rationale and try to uh, try to interpret it, reinterpret it in terms of spectral sampling of matrices. So in this situation, the uh, the objects that we're going to observe are n by n little n by little n matrices, and they're going to be somehow extracted from from big n by n matrices and. In the examples that I discuss later, everything's going to be Hermitian. Um, so the, and these functions are going to be class functions. So they're functions of the eigenvalues only. So that's why we call it spectral sampling. Uh, so U is a unitary matrix in that setting of the appropriate size. And um, so, so why, and we would say that Y is freely randomized if for each unitary matrix U, Y is, uh, has the same distribution as the, uh, as U, U, Y, U star. So, um, and in particular, if H is independent of Y, if H is a Haar matrix of order capital N, a random matrix, then 
you can pre and post multiply by h and make yourself a freely randomized version of y that will not affect uh, the value of the class function. Okay, so wh what do we mean then by a sample? Well, by a sample, I mean you, you take your in initial matrix, you freely randomize it, and then you extract the leading n, little n by little n submatrix. And I will call that uh, 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 sampled, freely sampled, if you like, submatrix taken from the big matrix. And so the eigenvalues of the big matrix are capital N of them. And the eigenvalues of, the, uh, of this freely sampled submatrix, I will call it a spectral subsample. You, know, you have to be a little bit careful here about notation because in, in ordinary sampling, a subsample is a subset of these numbers. Uh, but in spectral sampling, it's not the case. It's obviously the eigenvalues of this freely randomized submatrix are closely related to the eigenvalues of the big matrix, but they're certainly not a subset. Okay, so now um, getting now to the idea of spectral sampling, I just define a natural statistic of degree D, and this, this is exactly the same definition as I had uh, a couple of slides ago, um, with a couple of, with just a few adjectives changed here and there. So uh, we talk, and this is going to be a polynomial functions of degree D. Um, it's a sequence of class functions on Hermitian matrices. So T, so T is a sequence of functions. So Tn is a function on Hermitian matrix is of order n, uh, defined for every n bigger than some degree. And, 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 the, and the key property of these functions is that, um, that the average value of um, T little n calculated on these little n by little n submatrices that are freely randomized submatrices has to be exactly equal to the value of T capital N on the big matrix. So this is the key inheritance property that ties this sequence of functions uh, together. Well, it's uh, sort of interesting just to see what comes of that definition. But um, it's fairly easy to see that the average eigenvalue will, will be such a function. Uh, and just, so, just um, so that you understand the distinction I'm making here. So K daggers are the, going to be these spectral uh, functions. And Ks without the dagger are just going to be the ordinary, uh, uh, the ordinary Fisherian uh, K statistics. So this is this is the average. So these, this is just two, two ways of, this one of course is a function of the eigenvalues and it's just the average of, of the eigenvalues and it's equal to the ordinary average. They, uh, things get more interesting when you get to higher orders. So when you go to the variances, so K2 dagger uh, is this, it's just the sum of the squares of the, the variance of the eigenvalues, but not divided by n minus one, now divided by n minus one times n plus one. So it's the ordinary sample variance of the eigenvalues divided by n plus one. And these two functions have this property. Um, there is another function of degree two that also has the same property also has this property. So the set of uh, functions of degree two, the set of natural statistics of degree two is a vector space of dimension two. Uh, I'm not sure if I've got the second one. I, I don't have it written down, uh, but there will be, there is one function uh, of degree one or a vector space of dimension one. There are two of degree two. Uh, there are three of degree three and five of degree four. And I will just show you oh, what some of them look like. This one we've already seen. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the sample variance divided by n plus one. And incidentally, if we had used the orthogonal group, this would be n plus two. Uh, but for the unitary group, it's n plus one. 
Oh yes, so here's the second one. Uh, these are the two of them of degree two, k1 squared, they're associated with the partitions of the integer. Um, and and th in that sense, they have the same structure as the Fisherian k statistics and the Pauli case. Um, k3 um, is the, the spectral k3 is the same as the ordinary non-spectral k3, but the divisor is, uh, uh, is different. And then when it comes to K4, uh, uh, the, the situation becomes more complicated, but uh, it's, uh, uh, you can express the spectral K4 in terms of the non-spectral Ks, the Fisherian Ks, but the divisor uh, is, uh, gets bigger. And there is a K2 squared, and there's also a K311, sorry, 3, 1, and, and uh, 2, 1, 1, and so on, and 1, 1, 1, 1. So there are five of them all together. So, so uh, they, uh, well, so these uh, K statistics are, uh, oops, um, these K statistics are related, uh, the, the spectral K statistics are related to three cumulants in the limit. So if you take uh, this, the spectral case, it's a function of the eigenvalues and, and it's a degree R, and you let the, the index go, now the, I have left out the index in, in this, but you let N go to infinity, the normalized limit is the R3 cumulant, and the normalized limit of uh, the spectral K of associated with the partition, the integer partition R plus S, uh, will be the product of two free cumulants, CR, CS, and so on for the uh, other uh, uh, spectral K statistics. So this is one way of trying to understand uh, from a statistician's point of view, what it is that the free cumulants are, are about, I hope, um, uh, in terms of sampling. And in terms of, so it gives you Sampling interpretation also gives you an interpretation of perhaps of free cumulants in terms of uh, finite matrices rather than uh, infinite uh, operators. So I'm trying to make a categorical interpretation of this here. So on the one side, we have simple random samples and injective maps. These injective maps can be considered as one fuzzy map. And you can talk about the category of simple random samples in which there's just one random map from a small sample, a small set into a larger set, um, essentially uh, ag aggregating these, making these random. You can think of that in the same way for uh, spectral samples. So the uh, maps that are involved there are uh, uh, Euclidean isometries and uh, from a small dimensional space into a larger dimensional space. So these are Euclidean spaces. And, uh, and then there is, a, there is a notion of a uniform random way of doing that, which is related to uh, the higher measure on the bigger space. So in one case, then the observation is the pullback of this map by composition, pullback either of the fixed map or of the random map by composition. And in the other case that you're talking about matrices and the pullback is by conjugation. Okay, so that's basically all I have to say about uh, sampling. And this is uh, not, <coughs> not where I started off uh, uh, when I talked first to Vertitaro about uh, when the issue of categories came up, I was talking, it was in connection with something entirely different. It had to do with uh, representation theory and, and, uh, and, and spaces associated with linear models. So the third topic is completely, well, not an, uh, more or less completely unrelated to the, the, the first two. It has to do with representations and the structure of representations for uh, injective maps on finite sets. So nothing random about the maps in, in what's uh, going on from now on. So, um, uh, so, so the injective maps you're all familiar with. Um, 
and the injective maps include the finite groups. And the, uh, yeah, so M is less than N here. Uh, so the number of maps is the descending factorial. So what do I mean by representation of uh, injective maps? Well, it's, it's a, a whole, uh, I'm not sure if homomorphism is the right word here, but it, it's a functor from the injective maps into uh, linear transformations on vector spaces. And just to, to get the ball rolling here, the natural, the, the, the most obvious examples are associating every finite set with the vector. Now everything's going to be uh, real vector spaces here, just I'm a statistician, remember, so complex numbers don't really exist. So, uh, uh, so you just associate uh, uh, with each object, the uh, real, uh, the vector space uh, of functions on that set. And then you associate with this map, the pullback going in the opposite. So all of these representations are going to be contravariant. Um, and never, never come across any others that were uh, of any other type, but so they're always going to be on, in the opposite direction. So, um, this is the uh, initial uh, representation. Um, the reason why I got to talk with Bert Tataro and this was I was more interested in spaces of this sort where we're func talking about functions on the square or functions on the cube or functions of uh, the fourth order tensor product. And, uh, and what is the structure of the sub representations? Uh, in, in this space or in the higher order spaces. So these sorts of spaces arise uh, in genetics, where we're talking about crossbreeding plants, set, certain set of plants with another set of plants. And, um, and the observation is some measure on the progeny. So this would be a function on of the genetic fitness, if you like, of, uh, of each of the, of the crosses. And I was interested in decomposing this space of functions in a natural way. This one I sort of already knew about exactly how this would work intuitively, but these other ones I did not. Okay. So how do how do we get what do the sub representations look like? Well, given a representation, we already have a representation here. Um, a sub-representation is just a sequence of subspaces that is preserved by the maps uh, that are already uh, that you already have in your initial representation. So, the easy way to figure out what the uh, group representations are is just to use the what, sorry what the category representations are is to split these representations for fixed fix the set omega. And uh, look at how this, this splits up according to standard uh, symmetric group theory. And it splits up into the, the space of constant functions. And I will write the, the complementary space of functions that, uh, whose components add up to zero as, as the orthogonal complement. Um, now what happened, and, and you do the same down here for uh, a, a different set of a different size. And um, uh, it splits up in the same way, the constant functions and then the, the complementary space. And what happens to this pullback? Well, the constant functions go to the constant functions. That's fine. Uh, and this is basically the identity map then, but the, uh, the complementary part does not go to the complementary part here unless these two sets are the same size, which is, I'm not assuming. That's, so this is a consistency for different sizes I'm interested in here. So given a representation, uh, R omega, uh, then the, the constant functions uh, is a sub-representation when there's no complementary uh, sub-representation. So in that sense, the way in which these representations split up is a bit more like uh, the, um, non the representations for non-compact groups than it is for compact groups. 
Now, I wasn't in fact interested in just uh, just this um, uh, way in which this representation splits up, which is very uh, uh, simple. Uh, but for uh, in, in factorial designs, there might be several factors, uh, or treat it might be in, in a particular in a, in a typical field trial. There would be something like rows and columns, and and, and treatment in the simplest case or variety planted. And each of those uh, is, is a, a factor. Uh, and, and we're talking about injective maps for each of the levels of each of the factors. So taking a subset of the rows, taking a subset of the columns, uh, or taking a subset of the, uh, of the varieties that are planted. So we're then talking about the product category of injective maps on each of the three sets. Okay, um, so we're then talking about functions. Uh, so the morphisms then are going to be the ordered pairs um, and the tensor products. Uh, so what are the tensor products of this uh, product representation? What are the sub-representations in the tensor product um, of the sub-representation? So uh, in order to, say something about that, I'm going to revert to statistical terminology. So A, B, and capital A, B, and C here are uh, something like rows, columns, and treatments. And they're each a function uh, on the units. And they each are functions taking values in some typically small finite set. And then the response is a function on the units. The observed response is a function on the units. Um, that should be non-script. And then the, uh, the expected value is a function on the product of these sets of levels. Uh, so omega A is a set of levels of A, omega B is a set of levels of B, and omega C is a set of levels of C. So Y itself will not be a function on, on this because you could have two units that have the same set of levels but would not have the same um, I would not have the same uh, observed value, but uh, by exchangeability, the expected value will have to be a function on this product set. So ultimately, we're, when we're interested in linear models for the expected value, we're interested in sub-representations for injective maps uh, uh, associated with each of these three factors. So that's the question here. So. Uh, the product category uh, sub representations in this space. And these are what are called in statistics the factorial subspaces. And I might as well show, tell you what, what they are and how, how that breaks down. It's not too, it's not especially difficult. Um, so we start off with this representation, the product representation, and we write. R omega A is the set of space of constant functions, uh, which is a subset of the whole space. So this is one of these uh, uh, oddities in statistics that the notation, the terminology and notation have to do double duty. Uh, so A is both the factor and the vector space. Capital A is both, uh, and that's fairly standard notation that the notation gets overloaded here. So we have got the constant functions uh, for on B being a subset of the whole space for B, constant functions on C being a subspace of the whole space for C. And uh, these tensor products have the uh, following form. I suppose that should be an isomorphism rather than an identity. Um, but uh, that just means the space of functions that depend only, uh, or the space of functions of all three levels that depend only on the level of A. And how to get, what are the subspaces? Well, in order to figure out what the subspaces are, you just take, take a component from here, ten tensor it with a component from here, and tensor it with a component from here, and the, uh, and those are called the, uh, the, the indecomposables. So they're just one A, B, and then you have got these uh, embedded tensor products and the, the whole tensor product. 
um, and they have this, uh, they're, they're, they're nested in this way, and I have left out uh, some, uh, some uh, you know, if, if this, this big space includes the AB and also includes AC and BC, and the space AB includes A and B and so on. Uh, so we have all of these eight spaces plus their vector spans, A plus B, A plus B, C, and things of that sort. And so the whole thing splits up, you know, the structure of the splitting up then is the same as the structure of the free distributive lattice generated by the letters A, B, and C, the generators A, B, and C. Um, so this is an object that comes up everywhere in statistics. Once you've noticed it one place, the same thing comes up everywhere in, in a large number of places under different names. But uh, you can see that for uh, three factors, which three or four factors will be fairly typical in statistical work, uh, for three factors there are 20 of these subspaces. Now that includes the zero subspace, which would not usually be counted in much in statistics, but uh, uh, but this is the full count, just the dedicated numbers, and the numbers increase extremely uh, rapidly. Okay, so where does this, what does this give us? Um, I should say that the answer is uh, not new because these factorial spaces have been integrated into software 50 years ago. Uh, um, and so everybody knew that these were, this was the answer. It was a question of what the question was. So it's the formulation of the question that is new. And it's the formulation of the question that enables you to address uh, less familiar settings where the answer might not be so obvious. And uh, it enables us to formulate and answer uh, related questions, which what, what are, for example, are the sub-representations of injective maps for functions on the square, or the square is indexed by, well, it's the same set of fact, same set of, the rows and the columns are in one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, or the injective representations in, uh, in, of this type, the sub-representations. Um, and I'm not going to say what they are because the whole thing is a, quite complicated because of, um, because of, um, it's moderate, it's, it's, it's conceptually very simple, but uh, the answer is moderately complicated because of uh, isomorphic sub-representations that exist in here. But basically this, the splits, this thing splits up into the, the diagonal, the symmetric and the skew symmetric matrices. And then each of those splits up into sub-representations which can be combined in various ways. Okay, so a summary of what I uh, wanted to put, get across today, the idea is that uh, from, in statistical work, inheritance, mean, the notion of tying together functions on different spaces is quite important. And the notion of inheritance in the, on the average uh, for both ordinary uh, symmetric functions and for spectral case statistics uh, uh, seems to be uh, quite important. And it's also important uh, in the representation theory for factorial models, uh, the representation theory for injective maps for understanding factorial subspaces as, as projective systems. Well, that's it from me. I'd be happy to take any questions or Okay, whatever. well, thank you very much, Peter. So before questions, let's um, give you a, a round of applause, either through muting, uh, unmuting, or through the, via the icon. And um, do we have questions for Peter? So I, I had a question, but it's a bit off topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, potentially in, in so it's, I, I found the notion of natural statistic very intriguing and I'm, I'm not, I'm not seen that before. And uh, as formulated, it's, it's, it's all formulated for um, 
finite probability as befits the statistic subject, but does it make, is, is there an analogous notion for continuous probability? Well, uh, when you say finiteness, it's for finite samples. Yes, for finite samples, yeah. but the, prob so probability have... is, the probability is not discrete. So, uh, no, uh, so, sorry, but, well. Yeah, but so, but it's always for uh, finite no, samples, no, yes. Yeah, but suppose we're talking about statistics on probability measures on continuous spaces. Is there, is there some sort of similar way of classifying st statistics in that? context into no, so, 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 sort of my, my philosophy of, of statistics is that what you can observe is always in some sense finite or finite dimensional so everything that I've thought about is intrinsically finite dimensional and I haven't tried to um, yes I just yeah uh, uh, I so wondered if it was known so I'm thinking of something that classifies say the mean and the variance and so on as natural operations because they satisfy some sort of principle with respect to dividing the sample space up and um, so, uh, anyway, yeah I don't know but uh, yeah yes well that's, uh, that's, that's, that's basically what it is uh, you're dividing the uh, yeah you're, you're looking at your sample as a, as a, you're looking at it as, as if the sample size in some sense, or more generally the design is, is an incidental yeah. uh, to the whole operation. And so whatever you do or say shouldn't be affected by that, those sorts of incidental uh, aspects uh, of it. Yeah. Uh, does yeah. anyone mind if I ask a question? I have a question at some point. Okay, go ahead. Roland was first and yeah. then Tom. Okay, so coincidentally, it is actually for Tom. Uh, I was wondering if you saw any connections with magnitude in that? Sorry, any connections with what? With uh, magnitude theory. No, I have no idea what magnitude theory is. So I don't know, I can't, so the answer is no. So maybe someone who also wants to ask a question um, might be able to say something on that. Yeah, so um, no, but Roland, I'd be happy to hear wh whatever you have to say, um, whatever you're thinking about that, maybe in Zulip. But, okay. But, but Tom, did you have a question? Did you yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, so, Peter, I know that you've been writing about um, categorical approaches to statistics for a long time. I, I was looking at your 2002 paper about statistical models. What kind of reception do you get from statisticians in general when you uh, speak to them about this, your ideas? Um, well, every commutative diagram reduces the, uh, uh, the audience by a factor of uh, 0.1, roughly. So <laughs> uh, there's a tolerance for commutative diagrams is very low. Uh, and uh, yeah. So generally speaking, um, well, I mean, there's not, there's not, I would say there's no negative reaction to it, but it's not especially positive either. And, and when you've um, succeeded in raising the interests of people with no categorical background, what, what is it that pulls them in? Um, so most of the, the, the individuals that, that the individuals who would get pulled in would be mostly people uh, from, with an algebraic background in perhaps group theory, um, and uh, and you know the, it's not that there's any host, uh, there's any hostility to these ideas. It's just that uh, they only uh, many people uh, most people would say well they only confirm intuition. Uh -huh. These factorial models, and I should be clear about it now, the factorial models have been around for 50 years and, and codified in, in uh, statistics, uh, but there has been this issue which is called marginality, which has been, been a bit of um, a controversy in the uh, literature for some time, but roughly speaking, it means using uh, group representations that are not category representations. Uh, 
that don't have this inheritance property. And, and the, the, my co-author, John Nelder, always argued strongly against using these models that didn't have the inheritance property, but his arguments were not of this type. They were saying it doesn't make sense for various reasons. And of course, I agree with him, uh, uh, but for, not for the reasons that he was giving. So in, in that sense, uh, it, it confirms, uh, much of it confirms intuition, which is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But from my point of view, not only does it uh, confirm intuition, but it also enables you to tackle models where the intuition would be uh, not so strong. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, any more questions? Uh, sorry, a small follow-up to Tom's question. So again, for Peter, so commutative diagrams are apparently not very well received. Have you or anybody else had experience with string diagrams? Are they better received, maybe? Uh, I, 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 I'm not. Uh, you know, my background in this is very sketchy. So. Uh, String diagrams. Are you talking about uh, initial points? Uh, what do you call them? Uh, five. I've forgotten the terms now. Uh, when you say string diagrams, what is it you mean? What's happened? Hello. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah. so Peter, yeah, Peter would like you to explain what you mean by string diagrams. So, uh, string diagrams are basically circles and lines that are usually useful to present things that happen in monoidal categories or related constructions. Oh, okay. Maybe since they are a bit similar to graphical models and statistics, I would suspect that they could be better received, but of course I'm just conjecturing. I don't know. I'm asking. Well, yeah, so the, the graphical models are certainly are uh, quite well received uh, in big areas of, of statistics for understanding some aspects of the dependence uh, among random variables. Uh, but um, yeah, but in recent years, those have become more and more complicated. So the initial simplification seems to have disappeared as part of the rationale there. Um, those commutative diagrams definitely are a, a bit of a people are just not used to looking at them nor am i nor am i really i mean I, I have to work hard to to figure out exactly what's going on when i uh when i see them in this conference so i'm, I'm not as adept as uh, at them as i ought to be yeah thank you okay thank you um any further questions Yes, um, I'd, I'd like to ask um, something as well. Um, so, the <clears throat> if I understand correctly, uh, if you're an applied statistician and then you're using a statistic which support, as you have a choice to make about what what kind of statistic to work with in practice, uh, and then you can say, well, that naturality condition, the inheritance, um, singles out a particular kind of statistic particularly natural one. So do you think it's, do you think that it could be the case that there are other naturality properties like that for which statisticians have not had any intuition? And so other ones that are still, that, that still remain to be found and that could help uh, statisticians with making those decisions? Um. Most uh, most interesting statistics is not as simple as the uh, exchangeable processes that I discussed. Most most of, uh, most statistical designs have have structure, row and column structure, or whatever nested structure, and there are definitely uh, 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 other classes of functions that uh, uh, that uh, are. Uh, that should be used in those settings. And um, a large part of the, uh, so the, the, the beginning point in all of this is to get the group representations and ask which of the group representations is preserved. 
and the group representations are sort of well known for various for various setups and there was a paper by Terry Speed back in the uh, 80s de describing uh, what uh, many of these uh, uh, what most of these were for, for various of the statistical designs. But uh, I don't know that anybody has looked at those from the point of view of inheritance. Now, he did not talk about inheritance. It was entirely uh, groups of various types, such as the wreath, wreath product groups for nested designs and, uh, and what the various uh, symmetric functions uh, would be in that case. Uh, but I don't so there is the issue then of inheritance for those, and that has not been, I, I don't know of any work in that area, for example. But that would be a, a small, small step in that direction that you're indicating. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. So maybe we've got time for one more quick question, if there is one. I have a question. It's not really a question, it's just um, a request for resources. I was wondering if you have anything written up uh, in the form of like a paper or a preprint um, about the naturality condition that you described? Well, they, they only, uh, I, it's written out explicitly in, uh, in the paper with uh, um, Elvira DiNardo, the one on spectral case statistics. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the condition is written out there and the connection with, uh, uh, with uh, um, Chuki's polycase and so on is, is stated there. Um, yeah, so that would be the best place to look for that. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, that was a perfect quick question to, to finish with. So I think we should um, thank Peter once again for um, giving such an interesting talk. And um, yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you, Apologies once again for messing up the time. <laughs>